Well, thank you very much for coming. Uh, Josie McDaniel Burkett and Holly May are helping us again today. We appreciate it very much. Chaplain Darden. A wise man once said that the race is not given to the swift, neither the battle to the strong, but to he that endures to the end. We must remember that this too will pass. Let us pray as you pray in your own tradition. Our Father, we thank you so much for calling us children, for connecting us, for making us all those that you have loved and cared for. So today, we give you glory for what you're going to do, even for those first responders as they look after the needs of your children, even for those healthcare professionals, even those that have been affected by nature, by storms. You can do anything but fail. And today, we claim victory. We understand that the righteous may get in a rut and the faithful may become fatigued, but we wait on you to change our lives. Thank you for what you're going to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, again, the purpose of this is to keep our people informed of, of what we know and what, what we think and why we're doing what we're doing. And I want to apologize for coming out a little late, but we had a a video conference with the president and the vice president and, and other officials uh, in Washington, in the White House, and most of the governors, I think, were on the line, I think, of 54 out of 55 counting the territories. And the, the good news that is coming, and we're hearing more and more, is, as we can tell around the country, the feeling is that the end is in sight, that, that the, the mission is going as well as can be expected. There's still a lot of work to do. We cannot let up, but the end is in sight and we're making, we're making progress. A few things to tell you before we bring up some others. I've today proposed a solution to the General Assembly. As you know, they, they left last week without uh, passing a continuing resolution to keep the, that is the budget and the money that is going to be spent uh, starting on July the 1st. And we don't want the government to close down, but it's difficult for them all to come back to the state house uh, during the, before May the 14th, which is the normal date that the General Assembly would adjourn. Uh, Cause that is probably when we will be uh, at our peak here in South Carolina. So what I propose to them, was that they need not return, that I will call them back in June, and, and by June, particularly by the, the fiscal year starts on July the 1st, so it, by the end of June, we expect our economy to be, to be humming. We expect to be well back in business by then, and I can call them back then, and they can come in then and pass that continuing resolution and any other important matters they think, and that way the government will not shut down. We will have no concern about having the government shut down. We will not let the government shut down, and it will continue on into the next fiscal year. A few other things. Uh, I've gotten some requests, you may have read about them, about postponing our primaries on June the 9th. Well, at this point, we see no reason to do that. Again, we, th we expect things to be moving along very well by then. So there's no reason to do that. Uh, we have current uh, voting methods with absentee voting and those things that if we utilize, utilize those to the fullest, we ought to be in, in good shape. And of course, the runoffs will be on uh, June the 23rd. And as we look around at other states, some of them have postponed their their elections uh, in, that were being held in, in May, and they are moving them back into June, some, about the same time as ours. So that seems to be, again, a, a positive sign around the country. I want to thank the hospitals for the great work that they're doing, and that includes everyone from the nurses and the assistants and the doctors to the executives and everybody concerned for the great preparation they did. As you know, we, we asked them to, to consider reducing elective surgeries as much as they could to make way for the, for the surge and to prepare to see how we can slow things, slow those uh, uh, open up beds for what we expect may happen and they've done so very well. Uh, the, the surge, we, we think our peak will probably be, we, we think in, in early May. So they are, are, are happily able to now, we know how to shut down, how to start back up. So they are, are now beginning to do more elective surgeries than they, than they were, but we are assured that 
when the time comes, when and if the time comes, to the extent it comes, they will be able to, to handle the medical needs of the people of South Carolina. We've got a lot of ventilators, we've got a lot of critical care beds, and our medical community, the healthcare community, is as organized and, and functioning as well as, as I've ever seen it. Uh, next week I will announce something new. We are going to call it Accelerate South Carolina. Uh, what is that? That is to accelerate, to find the best practices to get us back working at full speed and to go back, ramp back up to where we were before the virus came along. As you know, we were announcing record numbers of job growth and all of those things. We were right at the, at the top of our game and growing, and we want to get back there. So we are going to put together a group that will meet. It will be consist of people from manufacturing, from tourism, hospitality, agribusiness, from the state agencies, from the General Assembly, uh, you name it, it'll be there. We'll not be in silos, but be working together, keeping social distancing and doing a lot of things remotely. But we will come up with the best practices to get business humming again as quickly as possible in South Carolina. And it'll be measured just as we measured it carefully going into where we are now in restricting some businesses, in restricting activities, in, in asking people to comply with certain things, we're going to be coming out in this, the same measured and careful way to do so uh, immediately, to do so too quickly would be reckless, and it would be if we had a, re a, a, a um, return of the spread of the virus, it'd be virtually impossible for us to turn the system around again. But I'm going to assure you that we are going to find the best ways to do it quickly and safely. And we will have uh, return our economic revitalization and growth. We will have testing for contact tracing. We will be careful with the elderly and the, the vulnerable. And we want to be sure that we prevent a recurrence. Also, the, the CARES Act is another thing that this Accelerate South Carolina will, will be making plans for, and that is the money that we're receiving from the, the federal authorities. It's about $48 million. It'll be going to K-12 and higher ed, and then an, an additional $1.9 billion for the state and local governments. Now, what is that going to be used for? That is to reimburse us for the expenses that we have incurred in responding to the virus. And we are very grateful that um, that, is, that will be done, and we thank President Trump and his administration for that. And finally, one of our first steps in moving back towards the revitalization will be today I'm issuing an executive order. It's a small step, but it's the, it is a step, and there will be more, to open our public boat ramps back up for fishing and recreation. You know, in earlier orders, we asked people to to take life a little easy, to relax, to, to recreate, to get out and walk, exercise. Well, a lot of that happens on the water. A lot of fishing, a lot of families like to get on the water. So we're going to open those uh, ramps back up. But we still insist, watch your social distancing. Don't have any large gatherings. Do just like, do the things that we've asked you to do before and we'll be fine. So I say again, I, I want to thank the people of South Carolina for, for what they've done. And also I want to, want to thank the, the people in, uh, in, um, down in Hampton County and, and up in uh, uh, Seneca and Oconee County that, and, and other counties that were hit by these tornadoes uh, the, in, in spite of the devastating blow that has been delivered to them. They were taking care of the workers that were coming to clean up the roads, to clean, to get the trees out of the roads and out of the houses, and they were cooking them food. The churches were working to, and activated their kitchens to be sure that the, the people working on the power lines had food to eat. In fact, I got one report that some of them were sorry they finished their work because they're going to have to go home and go miss a lot of that good cooking that they, they'd gotten used to. So uh, again, I want to thank the people of South Carolina, but I say again, it's too early to celebrate. We, we've got to keep the lid on ourselves, contain your enthusiasm, because we still have to get out of this. But we're going to get out of it, and it, it's going to be sooner rather uh, than later. Thank you.
Thank you, Governor. Um, I'm uh, Linda Bell with the South Carolina Department of Health and Environmental Control. Good afternoon. Um, as of today, we are reporting 276 new cases of COVID-19, which brings the total number of people who have tested positive with this disease in South Carolina to 3,931. It's important to remember that no one is um, removed from the risk of exposure. To this disease. We don't understand about who is immune among those who have already suffered from the disease. We have a lot to learn, and there's currently no vaccine. So people in our community are getting sick and even dying still. And we're calling on everyone to stay home, but this is especially important if you have health conditions such as diabetes, heart disease, or lung disease. Locally and nationally, data show that the elderly, as well as African Americans, are disproportionately impacted by this disease. Also, although African Americans make up about 27% of the South Carolina population, they comprise 41% of COVID-19 cases for which we know race, and 56% of deaths associated with COVID-19 infection. At the core of this problem is the fact that African Americans are disproportionately affected by conditions such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, asthma, obesity, and are also disproportionately affected by um, access to care at times. People with those health conditions that have been listed are at higher risk of severe disease from COVID-19. And we recognize the critical need to address these inequities and in an effort to reach the different communities who are at high risk of having severe illness from the disease, we are collaborating with our state and local partners, both public and private. And this includes working with local churches to help communicate prevention messages to better reach communities of color about the risk, delivering 100% of our women, infants, and children or WIC nutritional services over the phone, we're working with partners to expand options in a variety of food categories to address WIC product shortages. And we're partnering with environmental justice advocates to raise awareness and providing sneeze guards to restaurants in the Department of Motor Vehicles. While we've been working to enhance our outreach efforts, we need to do more. We are exploring new ways to reach high-risk groups including working to form partnerships to help express how conditions such as diabetes, hypertension, asthma, and obesity exacerbate COVID-19 symptoms. DHEC is also expanding our testing capacity by deploying the Abbott rapid testing machines in pockets where testing access may be limited. We realize we're asking a lot of our residents and that it's not easy. But what we're calling on South Carolinians to do by staying home and limiting contacts is critical to controlling the spread of the virus and ultimately in saving lives. If you're 65 years of age or older or have conditions like diabetes, heart, or lung disease, you're at greater risk of becoming seriously ill from COVID-19 infections. So please stay well by staying home as much as possible, taking your prescribed medications, and wash your hands often and practice good hygiene. If you can't stay home because of work or to meet um, essential needs, please consider protecting yourself by wearing a mask. And this is especially important again for those with chronic health conditions. For the latest information, please visit our webpage at dhec.sc.gov forward slash COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Frank Al Sharma from the National Weather Service. Please, sir. Thank you, Governor. I uh, just wanted to give a brief update on the survey process for this historic tornado outbreak that we just went through. So far, as of mid-afternoon, we've had 16 tornadoes across the state of South Carolina, and five of those have been EF3 or stronger on the enhanced fajita scale. We have not seen that many strong tornadoes since 1984, so that gives you an idea of how rare this is. We, of course, unfortunately have had nine fatalities, uh, which is also the most we've had since the 1984 outbreak.
for a single tornado outbreak. I know that uh, it's been a little slow getting all the information to you. We still have folks out in the field because of the vast expanse of area that we have to cover. So the number of tornadoes and the number of EF3 tornadoes may still go up over the coming days as we complete that. And please remember we are still in the peak of our severe weather season, so to continue to review your action plans in case severe weather strikes. Thank you. Director Stenson. Thank you, sir. Yeah, Kim Stenson from State Emergency Management. I'm going to provide a, an update regarding the tornado outbreak uh, that was occurred on Monday on the 13th. Uh, damage assessments continue. As Frank mentioned, it covered a fairly large area, but the hardest hit areas include Aiken, Berkeley, Colleton, Greenville, Hampton, Marion, Marlboro, Oconee, Orangeburg, and Pickens counties, uh, all of which reported multiple homes damaged uh, or destroyed. So the statewide residential damages right now uh, are 1,147 homes in 21 counties uh, sustained some sort of damage, and that includes 199 homes with major damage and 198 homes that were destroyed. Uh, in particular, Hampton and Oconee uh, counties suffered uh, significant losses. Oconee with 221 homes destroyed or with major damage, and then Hampton with 82 homes. Uh, destroyed or with major, major damage. Current estimates in terms of the infrastructure damage, and that would include debris uh, removal and emergency protective measures, is right now around uh, 10 million and is probably going to be more than that. Uh, our peak power outage was at 290,000, uh, and that's currently, uh, last I looked, was right around uh, 1,400 uh, earlier this afternoon. Uh, so that's a considerable drop, obviously, since, uh, since Monday. And then uh, DOT reported uh, over 2,500 trees earlier, blocking 100 roads, but uh, most of them, 99.5% uh, uh, have, uh, have been opened. Uh, debris clearance will uh, be completed for most counties next week, but for those hardest hit counties, it'll probably take two to three weeks to clear all the debris, uh, and that includes Colleton, Oconee, Hampton, and Pickens. And uh, some of the state and voluntary agency uh, assistance right, to date includes uh, search and rescue uh, support to the local level, uh, debris clearance, damage assessments, law enforcement and security support, uh, building inspections, and sheltering. Uh, working closely uh, with the local authorities in FEMA to determine if the current estimated damages will result in any kind of federal assistance, and that could come in the form of a major federal declaration or a small business administration uh, declaration. Uh, residents can help uh, with the state and local emergency managers in determining the scope of this particular event. Uh, anybody who sustained damage could report that damage in the damage assessment tool in our South Carolina emergency manager mobile app. Uh, it's got to go to the tool section and that'll allow you to do that to include taking a picture and sending that up to us. Also like to mention too that uh, We've activated the uh, uh, donated good system uh, for COVID-19, uh, similar to what we've done before in hurricanes and floods, and certainly looking right now in particular for personal protective equipment uh, that could be donated to safeguard healthcare uh, professionals and first responders, and that includes gloves, gowns, fa face shields, N95, uh, respirator masks, and hand sanitizer. And you can either go to our website at seemd.org uh, and follow the links there, or you can just call 803-737-8518 if you have a donation. And then last point just want to mention is uh, our website does in fact have lots of uh, good information to keep you connected. Uh, it's sort of the central clearinghouse during emergencies. Uh, it's got plenty of links in there. Uh, you can get a lot of questions answered or it'll tell you where you need to get, go to get those questions answered. Uh, and again, that's uh, at scemd.org, scemd.org. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Bobby Hitt, Secretary of Commerce. Thank you, Governor. Delighted to be here today um, to tell you that the business community is continuing to operate while we have portions of it closed down. Uh, majority of our manufacturing community is operating without incident. Uh, we are practicing uh, safe distances in our uh, workplaces. Many of our large companies, however, are shut down at the moment by uh, for production. The companies are operating, but they are not producing, such as our automobile companies, our many of our tire companies, and the like. 
and that's mainly because of supply breaks, uh, because the supplies that keep these plants alive are coming from other states where we cannot get uh, all the parts on time, and, and therefore uh, you don't build incomplete product. It doesn't, doesn't make sense business-wise. Uh, we will be opening these plants back up next month. Uh, the plants are making preparation for it now. We are in, con in consultation with them. Uh, so we'll see our businesses come back next month. And also we will, we've been working uh, at the governor's suggestion. We have brought together a number of agencies. We work together very well. He mentioned Accelerate SC. Uh, embedded in that, commerce will play a role in bringing together a number of agencies, including our entire tourism area. Uh, Dwayne Parrish uh, and I have been on the phone daily for weeks uh, talking about how we will unfold uh, a recommendation to the governor as to how we bring back our tourism industry. Uh, likewise, with uh, our agricultural area, with Hugh Weathers, we're talking about what we do about our farm supply and how we maintain that, and more importantly than uh, for all of these, and how we manage our logistics and transportation system in the state to make everything come back together and work. Uh, we are ready for this. Uh, we have been planning it. We will have outlines for our companies. We will help them understand exactly what they need to do. Uh, the ones that are particularly large ones are very important to us uh, because these will really be our test bed, Governor, when we bring uh, 4,000 people into a building uh, and produce automobiles, we will know that our system works. Uh, the companies are very excited about this. They want to have all the proper, you know, most manufacturing operations have PPE already. So now we will add some additional PPE. We will add testing. Uh, we're working on that, all want there to be testing. And then there'll also be rules for our associates as to how they uh, perform when they go home. How do they prepare to go from a workplace to a home place where they've been around several thousand people. So we're convinced that we have the right protocols in place. Uh, we've been working with the medical university and with our other agencies, uh, and we are ready to go. And we will be ready to make recommendations to the governor, and we will be looking forward to bringing our business community back into operation, probably in a staged way, uh, next month uh, until we get to complete, uh, a complete economy running again, Governor. Uh, I believe we'll see, uh, uh, Dwayne Parrish is not here today, but we've talked a lot about uh, tourism, he and I, uh, and we believe we can make South Carolina a safe place to vacation and that people will want to come here. We are different than some other states that face tourism impacts. We're a drive-to state. And the Lord knows people around us in our neighboring states are restless to go to the beach. So we can create the beach to be a good place to go uh, with proper distancing, working through our hotels and through our restaurants and other things. We believe we can make South Carolina a destination that people will come to and looking for a respite after this long, uh, difficult period that we've all been through. So we're not quite there yet. But I want you to know our agencies are working, and we're working together, and we will be ready, and we will be ready to bring South Carolina business back. And one other thing, just uh, we seem to all be talking about uh, COVID-19. I'm here to tell you yesterday I was on a phone with a, a prospect, that, a very large prospect that wants to come to South Carolina. There is business as usual out there for us at the Commerce Department. We are still talking to future companies that are looking to come here. And in fact, it's interesting to me, I remarked to one of my colleagues this morning, I've had three conversations in the last four days with prospects, and not a one of them has brought up COVID-19. So uh, everyone knows we'll get through this, huh? So everybody knows we'll get through this, and when we get through this, We'll be better and we'll be smarter uh, and we'll continue to be smarter every day. Um, thank you, Governor. Yes, sir. Glad to answer any questions. Any questions? Governor, you yes, ma'am. Opening things back up sooner rather than later. Do you have a set timeline in mind? Don't have a set time, but as soon as the, the facts, the data, the science, all of that indicates it's time to do it, that's, that's when we do it. I, I would love to see things that the President had been talking about May the 1st. Some of the other governors have talked about May the 1st, some a little later than that. I think we'll be able to, to, to keep up and maybe even get ahead of, of some of our other states because of the way that we took a deliberate path in closing down only those things necessary that, that uh, were places where the, where the disease would spread the, the quickest. We'll be able to, to move out of that, I think, quicker than some, some others. But uh, I think we'll, we'll have businesses opening uh, back up, uh, certainly uh, sometime in May, 
and we'll we'll be we ought to be humming again by the end of June, which is the, the end of the fiscal year, which is why the legislature needs to come back, and I'm willing to call them back, uh, to to come back before that date, when things are safer than they are now, to so they can pass the necessary legislation to keep all of this going, so we can handle all these things that we're talking about, including the the funds that are coming in to to reimburse for for a lot of the money that we. Uh, we've spent, but as soon as we can do it, I promise you, everyone here, we've all been talking to, to a lot of the same people. People are eager and ready to go, but it's not quite time yet to remove all of these uh, limitations and, and rules. We, we have to be safe. We don't want to be sorry, and but uh, we want to move as quickly as we can, but also as safely as we can. Yes, sir. Governor. Uh, there's a lot of money in the CR that's tied up to, that's tied to COVID-19. There's money for elections. There's money. There's colleges, and universities that are looking to furlough employees. That's right. And the, uh, but they need permission from the legislature. Um, so why are ask why are you I guess telegraphing that you're wait until June to call back the legislature? Why not call them? No, we'll we'll come why back call them sooner. We'll come back when they want to come back. It's just. The, the date of May the 14th is, is by law. That's, that's when they, they shut down. But I can call them, I can, in order to extend that date, they would have to come back to Columbia and vote to extend that date. Well, a lot of the legislators that are concerned like other people in getting in a group like that. So my point is, let that date, let that date pass and it, when it is safer and when they want to come back any time before the June the 30th, at which time, that's when the new fiscal year starts, uh, July 31st, we can call them back, they can vote and go back home and everybody will be safe. We'll keep the government running, we'll have the money, we'll be able to do all these things and we'll avoid an unnecessary risk uh, by having that group all together assembled in early May. Governor, do you plan to reopen schools still? Is the plan still to reopen? We're, we're working on that. The Superintendent Spearman and others are, are working on those plans now. They've not been finalized. We're hearing from some people also who work in plants, um, big plants that are still open, saying that they're not following proper social distancing measures. Who's enforcing to make sure that these you know, big manufacturing plants are enforcing those measures for their workers? I'll be glad to answer that. I'm not aware if you have any specific information, I would, you can tell it to me in the hallway, okay? Uh, most of our big plants are not operating right now because of supply breaks. Uh, most of the plants have people working in them now to find those pinch points, put in plexi and other things in order to give distance. Manufacturing plants are used to dealing in, in a hazardous environment. They work with PPE, a lot of people wear protective clothing in manufacturing plants. Uh, so they're very cognizant of, of the dangers that are there. They're also very cognizant that they can't bring thousands of people into a facility uh, and have it not work. Because if they do, they get set back too. So everyone has the same motive to get this done right. Uh, everyone's on board. Every company that I've talked to said we want testing at the front door. Uh, they're asking us what we can do in, in regards to that. And the governor and I and others are talking about how that's going to get done. But the point is, our businesses want to come back, but they want to come back safely. Uh, let's remember, we were in a state that had very low unemployment. Our employers value their employees. Uh, they will not put them at risk. Uh, right now, our big plants are not operating because they don't have supply. And some of those supplies come from other states or even from other countries. Uh, there's some materials that come from Mexico, and there's some change in the environment as how materials move from Mexico. So, we have a, a number of problems to untangle, but we remain fairly confident that we can get through these and be ready by next month. Yeah, just uh, to follow on with that, I mean, some of these big businesses, BMW, Volvo, uh, Boeing, that have all shut down their South Carolina operations, I mean, you anticipate that, that all those could reopen next month. Do you have an idea uh, when in next month? Well, each, each one of them will have their own opening date because they'll have their own individual issues they have to deal with. So, for instance, uh, uh, as some of you know, I used to work at BMW, so I know for a fair amount about that one. Uh, in this particular case, they have like four suppliers that are in other states that until those suppliers can open in those states, they can't open here. Uh, Boeing's got some issues as well. Uh, Mercedes-Benz van has some issues. Uh, Volvo has issues. All of them are working on those issues. We, as, a, as, a, as an agency, are helping them. If there's something that we can have a supplier swap uh, with something in South Carolina, we've already looked at that. 
But in most of these instances, these are more precision type things and you can just put together in a matter of weeks to substitute. So much less get a good contract for thousands upon thousands of a particular part. Um, so each company, just like each person, is gonna have a little different personality, but all of them are telling us they're shooting for a time in May. Working to get access to more testing. We keep hearing testing is an issue, and these companies you say want testing at the front door, but we're still seeing kind of a shortage across our state. So what are the efforts to get more testing, whether antibody testing or rapid testing in our state? You, uh, all I can tell you is the companies that we're talking to are looking for the protocols that will come from Dr. Bell and, and, and Rick Toomey and the people at, at DHEC. Uh, at the very least, they're talking about they want to take temperature. If someone's got a temperature issue, then they would be, you know, moved off to somewhere else for a different level of testing. So I think we're going to see different ways that people are going to do it, but there are experts here that I'm, I'm not one. Okay, Dr. Bell. I'll try to address some of that. In, in terms of testing, we are uh, doing a number of things in the state to improve access to the um, testing supplies and the reagents to get positive results. Uh, and this includes uh, some of the healthcare facilities in the state are developing their own capability to do different types of tests, whether it's the genetic test or the antibody test. Um, right now, we are focusing on testing people who are sick to allow them to, turn, to return to work, uh, most specifically for healthcare workers that they need to be tested to make sure they're not shedding anymore to return to work. Um, in other um, environments, business settings, we generally don't want to test people who are well because um, there is still the possibility that they could be exposed at another time then they get sick. So we want to test people when they have symptoms. So screening for uh, using a test to screen people to return to work who are not sick, uh, it's better to monitor for symptoms to check temperatures and, and uh, do a symptom check. Dr. Bell, while you're up there, um, so we've heard these dates thrown around May 1st by the president. The governor says he wants to have the businesses back and humming by June. Do you have any concerns about that kind of thing? Do you think it's a little premature? Um, what's your opinion? Could this set us back infection-wise, opening up too quick? Well, I'm, I agree with the governor's statement that we will be looking at the data to tell us about disease activity. So when we reach a period that we are clearly on the, the downward side of that slope and that disease activity has remained at some low level for um, some period of time that we have some reassurance that it's not going back up again, then uh, we would use the information uh, about disease activity and not a date on the calendar and do don't think, want to risk that rebound that, that he has mentioned. Do you think June is feasible? Um, it, it, it depends entirely on how effective our uh, social distancing measures are now. If we can get that, that curve low and um, stay in that area. So again, we can't pick a date. We are looking at disease activity. Governor. Um, you know, considering Secretary Hitt um, wants uh, sex business to open up next month, how, how soon do you hope to have XLRSC have its plan ready on uh, plan finalized? Well, Accelerate SC, will, the, the, <coughs> the plan will be comprehensive. There will be a lot of advice. Some, some we can put, uh, put to work immediately. I mean, I, I would like to say we will be wide open by May the 1st. I, I don't know if we'll be wide open by May the 1st, but I'm, I'm confident we'll be, we'll be moving. There'll be some openings by May the 1st, but uh, pro possibly not across the board. But uh, if, if, it's, uh, if it were tomorrow, if the facts and the, the data showed that tomorrow was a good time to do it, that's, that's when we'd do it. We want to do it just as quickly as we can, but as safely as we can, so that we don't have a, a rebound to where we end up worse than, than we started. Hey, Governor, yes, ma'am. How is um, COVID-19 affecting your state employees? I mean, has there been a reduced workload for state employees who might have to take PTO now or not get paid because rather there's not enough work or a co-worker well, The state positive? employees have really been a, 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 a great group because we, of course, ask them to work from home. And I think it's something like 70, we've been as high as 77%. I think today or yesterday, we 77% are either on regular leave or, or working from, from home. So uh, they, they've, done, they've done very well. But those who can't access... Ma'am? Those who can't access PTO, say you're a government employee and you're furloughed and don't have PTO, are there people who are experiencing that or what are you urging people who are in that situation to do? In what situation? People who don't have PTO, um, who are government employees. What's PTO? Paid time off or oh, vacation. Oh, goodness. Paid time off. They can use paid leave. There are a number of things that they can do. 
that the HR staff, that, uh, the central HR staff has trained all of our HR directors as to how we're going to handle it. In some cases, they can use sick leave. Uh, we're not, I'm not aware of anyone at this point that has been unemployed and unpaid by the state. Uh, we still have many employees on the job, including a lot of people in this building. Uh, in my agency, we are operating remotely. Uh, we are making plans for when we come back. We might do like an A-B operation where uh, half the employees work one day and other half work from home that day and we move it. We've got to gain, regain confidence. One of the things that's got to happen in all of this is not just the data, but how do we all regain our confidence? How do we regain the confidence that people want to come to South Carolina on vacation? How do we make it feel safe again uh, prior to maybe the time we have a vaccine? And that's going to require us to be smarter and to do things smarter and to do things somewhat in a business-like way. So I don't think we need to worry about our businesses. Our businesses are putting their money on the line, and they're not going to make a move until it makes sense for them. And let me remind you that all manufacturing is open in the state right now. We have manufacturing going on in every town and every hamlet in the state. The ones that are shut down are the very big ones that are shut down because of supply issues. But if a company calls me and says, my employees want to work, my customers need the product, what do you want me to do? I want you to tell your employees to be very smart. I want you to go look at the marketplace with them. I want you to let them give them feedback. They get feedback from you, give you feedback as to what they want to see different in a place. Because all of us are getting smarter. Every one of us looks around. Every one of us goes in the grocery store. We pay attention to the person standing next to us. It's now a part of our new condition. So now we need to learn to operate in that and regain our confidence in that. Businesses are good at this. And our businesses are operating now, and our bigger businesses will come back as soon as we can bring all the supply lines in place. They're eager to do that, and the people who work there are eager to do that, because eventually they will be spending their PTO, which they'd much rather spend on a vacation in November somewhere, or at first of next year, than to be spending it today sitting at home. So all of our companies are aware. The governor did an executive order that allowed people who are laid off, like from our uh, hospitality industry, they get their... Uh, unemployment insurance benefit and then they get an additional stipend on top of that from their employers they're allowed to do that which is normally not allowed and the employees are stepping up because they want to keep the economy going because they depend on the same economy we all live in we are all buying and selling from each other that's how this works we're a consumer-based economy our businesses are smart I've had several businesses come to me already with a surf safe workplace manual I got one on my phone right now that just was sent to me in the last hour from one of our major manufacturers. That's three plants in the state, and they've already designed theirs and told us, take anything you want from it and use it in any way you can elsewhere in the business place. So they're ready, and they're making preparation, but we're not ready yet. We still have a ways to go, and we still need to follow the instructions from Dr. Bell and, and Rick Toomey and others at DHEC as to what practices we need, but we're gaining confidence, and we're starting to see that we can reach a point where we can start back up these big businesses. Then we have other businesses that are shut down by executive order, such as restaurants and bars and places where we like to socialize. Well, we're going to have to learn again how to go into a restaurant and how to go into a bar. I'm not going to say anything about going into a bar, Governor. I'll stop on that one. But the point is, we may have to help our, uh, our, our restaurants know that we need to, maybe we have to crawl before we walk, and then after we walk, we'll start running again by the uh, by later this summer. But we have to take this in an incremental way, and our businesses know that, and they're ready for it, uh, and your agencies are ready for it, and we're working together right now on it. And paid leave, or whatever you call it, PTO, we'll be sure by executive order otherwise that our state employees uh, are not harmed by this virus. Governor, can you yes, tell us more about this conversation you had with the White House earlier today, this May 1st date that the President has been suggesting? Is this something he's pushing for states, or is he leaving it up for governors? He's leaving it up. He's leaving it up to uh, to to the governors, and it was emphasized in that uh, conference call that you referred to just uh, an hour or so ago, that uh, every state is different, and parts of the states are different from other parts. But there are a lot of excellent recommendations. Uh, many of the things that are listed there, of course, we we've already done, and and there. Are, there was no news in there at all, nothing that we hadn't thought of to either have already implemented, planning to implement, or uh, either going into the situation or, or coming out. But it's good to have the, 
the president and the, the entire administration their understanding that, it's, that, that the states have a lot of decisions to make and they are, as they said in that conference call, they are standing with us, whatever we need to, to accomplish what we're trying to do, that they are able to provide, they will provide idea of opening things back up next month are, are we seeing a flattening of the curve right now to suggest that it is possible or has it just been pretty steady I guess that might be more of a question for Dr. Bell yes. um, we've had some suggestions of slowing but I say that very very cautiously because we um, in fact yesterday had an, another bump in the number of um, reports that were submitted positive reports there are many explanations for that uh, one being that there's just a delay in reporting. So some of the uh, test results that we get are actually from labs that have been, uh, samples that have been collected from individuals a week or more ago. So there's a delay in the effect on the curve. Um, so there, there, are, there are bumps and dips in that curve. We have to see a trend and a consistent trend. Uh, what is encouraging is what we're seeing in other communities because we are, are recognizing some slowing uh, that there's stronger evidence for in some of the hardest hit areas. And so we anticipate that we will also see a similar slowing uh, when uh, we continue to enforce our social distancing measures. And so we ex expect that, but we want to see a longer trend of slowing. So I believe that we're still on the upward side of that curve. And from a medical standpoint, do you believe that the end is in sight for this pandemic? I'm sorry? I do you believe that the end is in sight for this pandemic from a medical standpoint? Well, I, I mean, I think that eventually this pandemic will resolve. We will have a pool of people in our population who will ultimately be immune. We, um, we don't have a test yet to, to indicate that. We are, there are questions about these antibody tests. And because we are um, really so early in the, in the pandemic, we haven't had a long enough track record to see if those tests that detect these antibodies or the proteins in the blood are actually protective antibodies. So once we get to a point where there's a, a larger pool of people in the population that we can confirm are immune, and, um, and, and we may reach a point with this new disease that there is actually some ongoing level of activity, always. It may become seasonal like the flu. There are so many unknowns. But the way pandemics have behaved historically is that they eventually will burn out. Now some disappear and some we achieve a level where the, the disease just remains present in the population but just at a lower level for a longer period of time. Dr. Bell. Yes ma'am, right there. Thank you. Um, this actually could be for Dr. Bell or the, or the governor. Um, how are you all trying to um, you know, keep some of those uh, recommendations that you all made with the COVID-19 response, social distancing, et cetera? Um, and also respond to, of course, the disasters uh, that we saw this week, uh, weather-wise. So if you can talk to me about kind of balancing those challenges and how you're trying to respond to the disaster in this era. Well, thank you. Uh, everyone that was responded to the disaster was well aware of the methods to keep the virus at bay, that is social distancing. And in the locations that, that we visited, uh, there was a lot of there was some, some tragedies, but uh, there were a lot of people without their homes. But you saw very little handshaking, very little, or if any at all. Uh, even the work crews were, were keeping their distance as they could from the people and as much as possible from each other. I mean, it's just common sense. If, if you want to want to retard the the growth and the spread of that disease, then you must follow those those rules. And everyone we saw under very trying circumstances, I mean the most trying circumstances, they were they were doing exactly as we'd asked them to do from this podium. Dr. Bell, are we still seeing a backlog of testing in our state? Are we still experiencing these long delays? Um, currently, our public health lab does not have a backlog and, and has the capacity actually to perform a lot more tests than they are currently performing. Um, I'm not sure if some of our um, private labs are having a backlog. In fact, the, the, the bump that we uh, recently experienced was the result of a, a small lab in another state that had held on to some specimens and then uh, submitted them all in one batch. And so we were encouraging all laboratories to report to us timely so that we are uh, not having a backlog in reports. 
And, um, and so some of the issues with the uh, testing capacity is that now that there are no backlogs, we want to do everything that we can to expand testing, especially in communities where um, we have not had an opportunity to widely offer tests. Dr. Bell, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, uh, you still see a peak in May, early May, is that correct? Um, so from the so from one of the models that's posted on our website, that's approximately right. That looks at the peak in expected deaths around the end of April or the beginning of May. That curve can move a little bit from day to day based on it's it's based on reported deaths, and as that changes, the uh, curve and the projection can change. And how confident are you when there are still concerns about inadequate testing in some parts of the state? Inaccurate testing. Inadequate. Inadequate testing, sorry. Well, um, we know that um, there are issues with availability of testing, access to care. We know that there are um, a number of counties that have not reported a high number of cases. We, we hope that that's a reflection of lower level of disease activity, but we also know that uh, based on our estimates, for every one case that we identify, there's the potential for there to be nine other people who have not been diagnosed. So we also rely on the estimated disease burden. And, um, but to answer your question most directly, we, we understand that not everyone who has symptoms um, has had uh, an easy way to find a test. And DHEC is working with partnership, in partnership with um, healthcare providers, the hospital association, to do everything that we can to expand testing in under-resourced areas and to um, look at other possibilities to make testing available. Yes, ma'am. Um, just for you, um, can you tell me why opening, yes, <laughs> why opening, uh, reopening of public health ramps? Why um, of everything to kind of reopen this, or uh, in the recreation uh, arena? Well, now? because we, <clears throat> that is a step that we can take now. That is a step that we think has no risk of exposure. Uh, still, law enforcement and the Department of Natural Resources will be available to en enforce the rules about uh, three or more people that are causing a problem or a threat to, to the health. But it, we are encouraging people to find recreation, encouraging people to go outside. And uh, if, if you're on a boat fishing with your, 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 your son or your daughter or your family, or, and uh, there's very little chance, very little risk there. Those are the kind of things we want to encourage. And we've had, at first we, we did not have much compliance with those rules on the waters. So we had to tighten up some, but now we're having, having good compliance and we think people understand they're using common sense. So now is the time to, to allow that kind of activity to take place, it's healthy activity. Yes, ma'am. Governor, we're seeing um, some petitions online for hair salons and some of these businesses that would like to reopen and do one client at a time. How do you feel about some of these businesses? All, all things are under consideration. Those, those businesses were ones that, of course, are judged to have a lot of close personal contact. And close personal contact, we, we know, particularly sitting in a barber chair, people coming in one after another, that is a... That's a, a way that where there's a lot of contact of, of different kinds. So that, that is why that was on the list of the, those uh, businesses that we reluctantly uh, asked to close. But we want to open everything up as quickly as we can. And I know I need a haircut. I, I don't know about everybody else. But yeah, I, I can see. But we want to open, every, every business is very important and very essential to the people that run that business. We understand that, and that's why we are doing everything we can to have the right kind of information, the right plan, the right facts to open things up as quickly but as carefully as we can. Yes, sir. With opening back up the ramps, do you have any plans to open back up beaches at this time? Everything is under consideration at this time. We get, in a, we get information. We've receive requests to close the beaches. We received facts. We, we had videos. We had law enforcement giving us reports, and it was time to close those, those beaches. When the time comes to, to open, based on the exact same type of information, we'll do so and hope to do it as quickly as possible. Governor, yes, uh, you said at the outset that you don't see any need to delay the June 9th primaries. Right. Um, the State Election Commission Director, Marcy Andino, and extent you and, and legislative leaders, a letter a few weeks ago 
uh, outlining other ways to protect the election, expanding vote by mail, no excuse absentee voting. It, currently, under current absentee voting laws, I was talking to election officials about this this week, uh, the virus is not an actual legitimate reason to be able to vote absentee. Uh, so they're, they're having difficulty responding to people who want to know, can I get an absentee ballot because of the virus? Um, you know, do you have any plans to expand some of those options? Those, uh, those such changes as, as that would be required by law. Yeah. And, uh, and under, the, I can't change laws. Would you support some of those changes if the legislature that, if, the le if the legislature will, will come in, and I would advise them if that's one of the things that, that it, at the time that appears to be something that needs to be done, then, then, we'll, then they will do that, and I'll be happy to comply. So yes, ma'am. States are um, implementing programs for people on food stamps to be able to order groceries online. Is that something you consider implementing here in South Carolina for those on food stamps, those at-risk populations, so they don't have to go into the stores? I think we, we have made, I'd have to verify that, but I know we've taken some steps in that direction and may have done that very thing. I, I know that we are uh, very, very uh, uh, cognizant of the fact that the request for the, those benefits is going up and they're being accommodated and perhaps in that very way. Governor, yes, sir. How well do you believe rural people are being taken care of during this outbreak? Do you think they are more at risk? Uh, is there anything the state should do to help people in rural areas where they don't have many hospitals or doctors or access to care and they're in poverty? So, so what's the question? Like, how well do you think people in rural areas are being taken care of? During well, that, that is, uh, the, the rural areas, of course, uh, are of, of concern, and they always have been. Uh, we are, uh, that's why we've been attempting, uh, Mr. Hitt has been vigorously attempting to get businesses to expand into those areas because just just one manufacturing plant in a a, a, a very low income area can change everything change lives for for everybody but uh, there's a lack of broadband there for computers uh, molly spearman the superintendent of education is working on on that educational television of which we have a, a great facility there is uh, highly uh, uh, interested in uh, invigorated in seeing that we get that kind of uh, instruction out to those people. They don't have broadband, so that limits them in a lot of ways. We're trying to get telehealth, telemedicine, all of telepsychiatry, all those sorts of things out into those areas. And the, if there is a silver lining in, in this is, is the funds that we have coming in and the experience we've had in trying to accommodate the people of our state wherever they are will help us in providing those services to them in the future. And to follow up to, uh, to Jamie's question, uh, about the, the June primary. Lawmakers have come back after the June 9th primary uh, to make possible changes. How, I mean, why not come back, have them come back before to make possible changes to whether people could get an absentee ballot? Well, they, they, they can come back before. The question is, is when? If the, the General Assembly, if they, if they do not come back, it, it, it will end on uh, May the 14th. That's why there are a number of them who do not want to come back in a congregate setting in the State House, in the House, in the Senate, or in other places to have to vote to do things that can be done only by laws. It can't be done by executive order. So to avoid that risk, I have suggested that they stay at home, work, do what, do what they do at home like, like everyone else and in their work and their businesses at home. And I have the authority to call them back uh, after the session, after May the 14th, at a, a time that is deemed to be safe, and they can come and, and pass such laws as they, including the resolu continuing resolution to provide the funds to keep the government working. We're not going to let the government go out of business on July the 1st. So when they come back, and I would, it would depend on them to tell me when they would like to come back, the House and the Senate, and it'd be based on recommendations from, from DHEC and others, and they can accommodate all of those things at very much less risk than they could if they were to come back between now and May the 9th, when the, or May the 14th, when the virus may still be spiking. And actually, to clarify something, on, or to give you the, uh, the, the time to clarify it, there, there was some interpretation of the letter saying, suggesting late June as a potential time for the General Assembly to come back. Some people interpreted that as you saying that the economy or the state will not be running again 
until late June. Uh, mm -hmm. I think based on your comments, it's clear that's not the case. No, that, but that was the, it, that, you're right, there was some, some misunderstanding about that. That was because the fiscal year expires at the end of June, June the 30th. So they need to be back before then, the end of June, if they're going to pass laws that go into effect the next day on July the 31st. Now, they can come back any time between now and then, uh, but if, to come back now would suggest, suggest would subject some of them to, uh, to risk. A lot of the members of the General Assembly are over 65, which is, we're told by Dr. Bell and, and uh, Dr. Toomey and others that people, the older you get, the, the more susceptible, particularly if you have underlying conditions. So uh, a lot of us, uh, we put our heads together and we determined the best thing would be for them not to come back if they don't want to come back. But I can call them back any time between Mark, May the 14th and June the 30th. Less and so to, to follow with that, do when people, because people were reading that to indicate when the stay at home order might end, yeah. when non essential business closings might end. To be clear, do you envision that some of those restrictions could go away within a matter of, of weeks? weeks? When do you anticipate some of yes. those restrictions going away? I, I anticipate that, I fully expect that, and that is, that is our goal is to remove those restrictions as quickly as we can. As I said at the beginning, I expect our economy, our businesses to be humming by the end of June. I certainly hope so. Now, we may be surprised, but I certainly hope so, and the sooner the better, that we want to get back to normal and get moving uh, as soon as we possibly can. Last question. How do you think DEW has handled the surge of claims they're experiencing? Today we see over 270,000 South Carolinians filing for unemployment and some still not being able to get through. So how have they done in handling this? They, they are, they're doing well now. Many of those delays were caused not by our computers or our people, but by, by the main social security computer uh, in, in Maryland, I believe is where it's located. Every unemployment claim in the United States must be checked through that one computer. It is an old computer and it certainly lacked the capacity to handle all the claims coming from all of the country all at the same time. That slowed us down. But we've started off with about, when this began, about 40 people handling the phones and handling the claims. I think we're up to around 300 now. We expect to be at 500, and they are moving them very quickly. It's a, an enormous amount of claims, and we are encouraged those who are, who, who are, are, are entitled to make that claim to go, go ahead and make it, and they will be provided whatever funds that they uh, would have gotten had their claim gone through immediately, they will get. Let me mention one last thing before sure. we shut down. Um, one of the uh, positives that we have as well is many of our companies are international companies. And so we have companies in South Carolina that have plants in other parts of the world that have already gone through uh, 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 COVID-19 and are opening back up. So we have the experience of what they are under going through. So for instance, BMW has two plants in China. Mercedes-Benz has two plants in China. Uh, Volvo has three plants in China. All of them are operating, so they have come through this, and they are also a test bed for us as to exactly what their processes were that will give us confidence as to how we can go forward as well. So we're all looking uh, constantly at what everyone's doing. There aren't any real best practices because this is so doggone new. So we're going to have to do it on the fly. But everything we're going to do, we're going to do based on some data or some information that we have that tells us it's safe here in South Carolina. We're a small state. We all know each other. We all protect each other. And we need to continue to protect each other, and we'll open up our businesses and get back to work. Thank you, Governor. Thank you very much.